Well, we will start the second session of uh, FSCD, and the speaker is uh, Ken Sagayori. So please, whenever you want. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm Ken Sakayori from the University of Tokyo, and today I'm going to talk about our paper titled Output Without Delay, a Pi Calculus Compatible with Categorical Semantics. Um, this is a joint work with Takeshi Tsukada. So as the title indicates, this work is about the Pi Calculus, the lingua franca of concurrent programming. Although Pi Calculus has been widely used, Unlike the lambda calculus, pi calculus does not have a solid logical or categorical foundation. Well, note that there is a well-established connection to logic if we limit the expressiveness of the calculus. It is well known that session-typed pi calculus corresponds to linear logic. However, for pi calculi that are expressive than session-typed variants, we still do not have a solid foundation. Actually, in our previous work, um, we pointed out a fundamental difficulty in developing a categorical type theory for pi calculi. Therefore, if a process calculi based on pi calculus were to have a categorical foundation, it means that it must be somewhat different from the traditional pi calculus. And in this work, we investigate how the pi calculus should be modified in order to have a categorical foundation. Now, let me explain what I mean by a fundamental difficulty. In our previous work, we showed that asynchronous pi calculus uh, processes, modulo observational equivalence, do not form a category under a mild assumption. Note that this situation is quite different from that of the simply typed lambda calculus, where observational equivalence is a beta eta theory. So, what is the assumption and what causes a problem? We assume that composition is defined by parallel composition plus hiding. Then the problem is that Special processes called forwarders work as right identities with respect to the composition, but they are not necessarily left identities. This means that we don't get a category from observational equivalence because in a category, the right identity must be a left identity as well. Forwarders are processes that forward the message from one point to another point. Um, in this case, this process is forward a message from channel A to channel B. And this is what I mean by forwarders are right identities, and this is what I mean by forwarders are left identities. And this equation, the first equation is actually a well-known equational law for the asynchronous pi calculus, but the second one does not hold in general. So the gap we want to fill is a discrepancy between categorical semantics and conventional operational semantics. In this work, the research question we set out to answer is, can we adjust the operational semantics to be compatible with the categorical semantics? Note that this is just one approach to investigate the gap between categorical semantics and the pi calculus. There are, of course, other paths we could have taken. And some frequently asked questions are, why don't you change how composition is defined? Can it be the case that the definition of composition is wrong? It could be, but parallel composition plus hiding is the most common choice, I would say. And we also don't have alternative candidates for composition. Also, one might ask, why don't you use other variants of pi calculus, like synchronous pi calculus? For us, it is not clear how to model synchronous pi calculus categorically. And for asynchronous pi calculus, we have discovered a categorical semantics by accepting the left identity law. So we have a base to build on. For these reasons, we stick to this question. And <clears throat> though I think the other approaches are interesting. In order to tackle the question, let us once again look at the problematic equational law. The law says that parallel composition of a private forwarder acts as a substitution for input names. This does not hold in because the forwarder can always receive a message via the name A and can hold the message as long as it wants. Whereas this process cannot receive a message via A unless this process is ready to receive a message. For instance, this process could be something like this. And in this case, the name A is guarded by name C. Since the delays that forwarders introduce seem like the problem, we may expect that the forwarders to behave as identities if forwarders do not introduce any delay. Then, of course, the next question to ask is, 
How can we define an operational semantics in which waters do not introduce any delay? Our idea is quite simple. We do not allow processes to stop while there are unguarded outputs. This can be thought of as disallowing buffering because in the asynchronous Pi calculus, output actions are often considered as a communication medium that can buffer messages. For instance, um, we consider these two transition atomic. This one is receiving a message using this input, and this one is sending the message using B. So these two transitions are treated as a single transition in the new operational semantics, meaning that there are no uh, delays in between them. Here are the contributions of our work. We formalized our idea and proved that the new operational semantics is compatible with categorical semantics. To be more specific, we proved that processes modulo observation equivalence, or maybe I should say barbed congruence, forms a category with certain structures. We also introduced a novel proof technique in order to deal with the new operational semantics. And this is done by applying the notion of linear approximation to pi calculus. Okay, this is the outline of this talk. Next, I will explain our target language and the main result. Our target calculus is a subcalculus of the polyadic asynchronous pi calculus um, given by this grammar. So this is a nil process. This is output action. This is parallel composition, this is replicated input, and this is name creation, and this is internal action. Uh, this is a calculus we introduced in our previous work. I think it is quite standard. Well, that being said, there are two things that I should mention too. First, we only allow replicated inputs. Non-replicated inputs are not allowed. This is because replicated inputs have better match with categorical semantics since replicated inputs are similar to functions. We also have, oh, sorry. Um, we also, sorry, the second point is that we, the name creation creates two names, unlike the conventional pi calculus. So in this example, um, this operation creates an input end of a channel and an output end of a channel. And the communications occur between names connected by the same new operator. We also assume that the processes are typed by an IO type system, so that things like RD mismatch does not occur, but I'm not going to talk about the type system because it's not important to understand this talk. Now let's talk about the operational semantics. We formalize our idea as a reduction semantics. We write P reduces to Q um, if and only if there is a tau reduction followed by communication that end up with Q where Q has no unguarded outputs. Um, here, these reductions with superscript are the standard reduction relations. This is a tau reduction and this is the communication. As an example, this process can reduce to this process in one step because after taking this tau off, this A bar will communicate with this input and then this message will communicate with this input. And after that, all the outputs are guarded. However, this process cannot reduce because there is no such queue that satisfies this condition. Even if we take off this um, tau action, then A bar can communicate with this input, but B bar cannot communicate with any other input. So that means there is an unguarded output remaining. So that is the reason why we cannot reduce this process. Okay, one might think that the new reduction semantics is somewhat extraordinary, but actually we can simulate the conventional reduction by adding tau in front of all the output actions because in that case, after one step of tau reduction, for example, if we take off this tau, um, only one output gets unguarded, and after the communication using that output happens, all the outputs are guarded. One quick remark is that this only means that the translation preserves reduction 
and does not mean that it also preserves various equivalences that take outer contexts into account. This is because context, not in the image of the translation, have additional observational power. This is the main result of our work. We prove that processes modulo barbed congruence, which is defined using this new reduction relation, form a compact closed fried category. Um, compact closed fried category is the categorical structure we introduced in our previous work, and the detail is not very important. This theorem is just a fancy way of saying barbed congruence satisfies certain equational laws, which in a way can be regarded as something like the beta eta equality of the lambda calculus. Um, all laws, except for the law that says waters are left identities, are well studied laws for the asynchronous pi calculus. Um, here are examples of equational laws that we showed barbed congruence satisfies. Uh, the first one is the left identity law, which we've been talking about. And the second one is a well-known law for the asynchronous pi calculus, which can be seen as a generalization of the reduction relation. And this is called a, a replication theorem. I mean, this equation is called replication theorem. Okay. Let me explain what barbed congruence means, especially in the current setting. We say that P and Q are barbed congruent if CP and CQ are barbed by similar for all contexts C. And barbed by similarity is reduction by similarity with the notion of observables taken into account. Here is a formal definition of barbed by similarity. If you already know the notion of barbed by similarity, then you will probably notice that it is exactly the same as the standard definition, except for the fact that we use this reduction relation for the transition. Uh, technically speaking, we also need to modify the notion of barb a little bit, but that can be done in a straightforward manner. However, as everyone knows, dealing with for all context is often a pain, and by similarity is another thing that is not easy to work with. What I just said might sound counterintuitive because by simulation is a well-established proof technique. But actually, in our current setting, it's not that easy to work with reduction by similarity. So the next point of my talk is about the proof technique, which we use to show the main theorem. As mentioned, it is based on the notion of linear approximation. First, let me describe why we need to prepare a proof technique. It is because directly handling this new reduction relation is quite hard. This reduction relation is actually a multi-step reduction of another reduction relation. Therefore, this new reduction relation is not inductively defined, whereas the traditional reduction relation is usually inductively defined. This makes it hard to play the bisimulation game with this new reduction relation, because in the conventional setting, one would probably prove bisimulation using transition induction, but we cannot do the same thing. To remedy this problem, we use linear approximations. It is well known that reduction sequences correspond to linear approximation or derivations of an intersection type system. And the good thing about linear approximations or derivations is that they are inductively defined. There's one thing that I should mention. Although these relationships have been studied, these studies are about lambda calculus, not pi calculus. So in order to use this technique, we needed to adopt the notion of linear approximation to pi calculus. So how does linear approximations of process look? Roughly speaking, an approximation of a process is obtained by distinguishing names according to their occurrences, replacing replicated inputs with finite numbers of input prefixing, replacing some part of the process by this symbol, which means undefined. <clears throat> For the sake of simplicity, we will use a CCS process as an example. I mean, we consider a process that does not transmit any names. This green part is a linear approximation of this process. We can see that some parts are replaced by undefined. And we can also see that this non-replicated, sorry, replicated input is uh, corresponds to this two non-replicated input. We use this um, double line symbol to emphasize that this parallel composition originates from replicated input. Now I will explain what I mean by reduction sequences correspond to linear approximations. A reduction of an approximation induces that of the original process. 
and there is essentially one way to reduce the linear process because the reduction is deterministic. <coughs> by deterministic, I mean there is no non-determinism caused by race condition because the binding already tells us uh, which name communicates with which. So this linear process corresponds to this reduction sequence because that is the only way we can reduce this linear process. I mean, the only thing we can do is take off this tau2, and then this communicates with this, then we can take off this tau1, and then this communicates with this, and this communicates with this. And this is, uh, this reduction sequence is what I just, corresponds to what, I, what just I said. Extension of a reduction sequence can also be represented using linear approximations. Extending linear approximation corresponds to refining an approximation, which roughly means to replace undefined with other expressions. For example, this linear approximation is a refinement of this linear approximation because these undefined are replaced with something more concrete. Uh, by the way, we use this order uh, relation symbol to express that a process is a refinement of the other. Because this first linear approximation already corresponds to this first half of this uh, reduction sequence, refining this um, linear approximations corresponds to adding these three steps to the reduction sequence. What this means is that we can play the bisimulation game using linear approximations. Since the approximations are both defined according to the structure of the original process, this, rela this relation also is inductively defined. Therefore, we can do some inductive reasoning to prove bisimulation. As I said, um, another difficulty in proving barbed congruence is that we need to deal with for all context. So how do we avoid such a difficulty? We just follow a very common approach. We use another equivalence that is sound with, with respect to barbed congruence, but does not need to deal with context. What is the another equivalence? Well, it's just a bisimilarity on open processes. What I just said is a very common strategy. But in our work, this bisimilarity is also defined using linear approximation, rather than introducing a standard labeled transition relation. Actually, um, this refinement relation is defined, already defined on open processes from the beginning, so there is nothing additional that we need to do. So far, I've explained the overview of our approach, so now let me explain some of the details. And from now on, the talk will get a little more complicated. The actual syntax of linear approximation looks like this. And to be honest, compared to the syntax given in the paper, it's a bit simplified to ease the presentation. The meaning of the constructs should be clear since they are not that different from those of ordinary processes. Um, here are some differences against ordinary processes. First, every variable and the constant tau is indexed by a natural number, and all of them are linearly used. Output and input take list of variables, represented by this mu, um, instead of variables. We also have this parallel composition operator used to represent parallel composition originating from replication. And bottom or undefined is simply defined as a null array composition of this operation. Actually, in the paper, we introduced linear approximations as derivations of an intersection type system. The intersection types are given as refinements of IO types. Since I didn't explain the IO type, I'm not expecting you to understand the type system. I just wanted to show how it looks. Our type system is a non idempotent important intersection type system indexed by natural numbers. Intuitively, intersection represents how many times a variable is used. For instance, in this judgment, this x has three intersections. So this means that x will be used according to rho uh, two times and according to rho prime one time. And the linear approximation uh, shows that x is, corresponds to these three 
linear variables. And type actually plays an important role in our proof of the main theorem. Um, this is a formal definition of the uh, refinement relation mean and as you can see it is inductively defined for example this rule says that we can enlarge the list and um, this rule says that one can add more parallel compositions to the approximation of a replicated process these two say that undefined can be replaced by tau prefixing or input prefixing However, we do not allow this rule, which means that we cannot replace undefined with an output action. This reflects the idea that we do not allow unguarded outputs. Um, note that we can add outputs if they are guarded. For example, an output can be inside this P or inside this Q. Now I'll explain the relation between types and linear approximations. Types and derivations form a presheaf. That is, we have a type environment. If if we have a type environment, gamma prime, that is larger than gamma, uh, we have a function that maps a derivation of gamma prime to a derivation of gamma. And this ordering for linear approximations are satisfied by these uh, functions. <coughs> Roughly speaking, a type environment is smaller than that of the other if it can be obtained by erasing some of the elements of the intersection types. Um, therefore, we can think of a uh, label transition system, P, where labels are types, actually the differences between these type environments, and nodes are approximations of P. And also, a natural bisimilarity for this label transition system can be defined. This is the bisimilation relation I mentioned earlier by saying that we introduced a bisimilation over open processes. Um, by the way, when you think uh, of th this pre sheaf as a label transition system, you need to swap the direction. I mean, the transition from P goes from P to P1 and P to P2. <clears throat> and working with types actually helps us prove our main theorem. Our main theorem is proved by showing that bisimilarity respects the equational laws. And this can be done by proof manipulations, so to say. I mean, the proof is not so different from the proof of subject reduction expansion of an intersection type system. For example, let us consider the case where we want to prove that this and this is bisimilar. Um, this actually is a special instance of the replication theorem. In this case, we can take the reduction relation of approximation as a bisimilation and prove that this diagram holds. I mean, what we need to show is that if P reduces to Q and P prime is a refinement of P, then there exists a refinement of Q such um, such that P prime reduces to Q prime, and vice versa. And this can be proved like uh, subject reduction and subject expansion. Okay, um, I'm done with the main part of my talk. So I'd like to mention to some related work that I could not mention in the body of the presentation. Um, I should clarify that we are not the first one to create an intersection type system for the pi calculus. An intersection type system for pi calculus has been proposed by Dal Lago et al. And derivations of their intersection type system may be seen as approximations of processes. Also, the idea of delayless forwarders already appears in the context of game semantics as delayless copycat strategy but it is still unclear how these relate to our work. Um, I'll end my talk by highlighting some future research directions. Firstly, I would like to clarify the computational meaning of the new reduction relation. I think it represents some sort of synchronous communication, but we still don't have any formal results that supports this view. Um, as I said, investigating the relationship 
between our work and the game's semantic work is also an interesting direction. I'd also like to explore whether we can use our calculus as a meta-language to investigate traditional PyCalculus. Um, this ends my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. You can applaud with the reactions. Um, if there is any question, please raise your hand and I will allow you to unmute yourself. Or you can ask in the in the chat. So no questions. Well, I okay. I I will start with one, and uh, of course, if you want uh, to ask any question, please raise your hand. So my my my, my understanding of uh, what the, what you explain is that so you you had to adjust the the definition of the the operational semantics to to um, and. I guess you also uh, you you had to adjust also the uh, the categorical semantics so they they match. So in the in the previous work that uh, that you had, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, so the, uh, the, there were a, a mismatch. But uh, how 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 it went? So you just say uh, okay, I have this categorical semantics. Okay, so nothing to do with the operational. Um, so I should, well, we, what we said is that if we admit the left identity law, then there is a very nice correspondence with, um, pi calculus and the categorical structure we proposed in our previous work. And actually the left identity law is, um, not always invalid. I mean, if you consider something like trace semantics, which is very coarse, so in if you consider uh, such a kind of equivalence, then the left identity law already holds. So it already had some match against the traditional pi calculus. Well, I mean, we had to modify the syntax, but it, it had some match. And but if we wanted to have a stronger correspondence. Uh, we had to either modify the categorical structure or the operational semantics. And we chose to modify the operational semantics as it's much easier to modify. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay, well, great talk. Um, there is room for one more question if uh, there is one in the audience. Okay, um, Rafael just sent a, a direct link to Clouder, which after this session ends, though after the four talks, you can move there if you want to continue discussing about this uh, this work, or you can go to any break room uh, at uh, Clouder. So thanks the speaker again, and um, we will prepare for the next one. Okay, thank you very much. I'll stop the...